Here we go. All right, here we go. Kicking off the inaugural, inaugural meeting of the California Aging and Disability Research Partnership. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today and not just today for committing to be a member of this, this partnership. Thank you all for your willingness to serve. I'm Susan DeMorris. I'm the director of the California Department of Aging. I know many of you from your um, years and years of, of outstanding work in this space. Many of you contributed to the master plan for aging in ways large and small. And some of you are new to me, so I'm really um, looking forward to our introductions uh, um, in just a minute. Um, I wanna thank our team for pulling us all together with an outstanding agenda today. Um, I especially want to thank Terry Shaw, who has been the backbone and linchpin and all of those good terms that, that we use. Um, she's, our, she's our human infrastructure in this space. And I um, just really want to thank Terry for her um, work throughout the Master Plan for Aging process as a consultant to the Department of Aging and for her just guidance and terrific work and, and partnership. And I wanna thank Sarah Steenhausen, our brand new Deputy Director for Aging um, Research, Aging Policy Research and Equity at the Department of Aging. Sarah joined us in January. And Amanda Lawrence, who many of you know is our Project Director for the Master Plan for Aging. So Amanda's been here since almost the beginning um, and has kept us on track. So I just have a few brief remarks. Um, it's hard to have energy in a Zoom meeting, but I'm very excited for today because I see this group as um, a key driver and sustainer of the Master Plan for Aging. And we've been really looking forward to today's meeting and the formation of this group. And we're really excited to, to get things started today. Um, not to put too much pressure on all of you, um, but you're, you're gonna play a key role in the future of the Master Plan for Aging. When we celebrated the one year launch of the master plan in January, the governor had a video, um, the governor prepared a video and Secretary Mark Galley, you know, they both shared that together we're just getting started. This is a 10 year blueprint for our state and we're just in, we're just starting the second year. And, and the work that we're gonna be doing here together is so important for the next nine years. Um, so you're, you're serving in a key role. We really want to lean into your expertise. We want to listen and hear from you. We want to take your suggestions and advice so that together um, California can keep, um, you know, we've already set the bar with having a master plan for aging. 22 states are following suit, um, including New York and their new governor um, is, you know, her first active business when she took office was to declare that she, you know, to, to have an executive order like Governor Gavin Newsom did to, to create a master plan for aging for the state of New York and 22 other states, large and small, are following suit. So that's a tremendous credit to many of you on this um, partnership, the funders who made this possible, including the SCAN Foundation, the West Health Foundation, and others. So I want to thank you for your work that got us to today. And thank you for the work that's ahead that we'll be doing together. And with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague um, in the California Health and Human Services Agency. And John, we're just so delighted that you can join us today and for this work going forward. So I'd love you to share some opening remarks with the group. Welcome, John. Sure, thank you. And I share your excitement. Maybe it's Friday. Maybe that's part of my excitement. <laughs> But definitely, Sarah, Susan, and the team, uh, it's just incredible what you guys are, are doing here. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is John O'Hanion. I'm the first chief data officer for CalHHS, uh, so my, my inaugural visit. Uh, I am also the director of a center that I'm starting up within CalHHS that the secretary brought me on board for, which is the Center for Data Insights and Innovation. And really, the best way to think about the center is there's a lot of great work happening in our 14 departments and offices and the uh, you know the the program of cal hhs is massive in terms of 200 billion dollars in programs almost half of the state budget falling within cal hhs so with that comes a lot of programs a lot of services a lot of people being served 
And we're really about how do, how do we keep advancing the Cal HHS agenda of making better data informed decisions and really seeing people as a whole person. You know, people don't want programs, they don't want services, they want help. And so when we look at the, the work that we put out there, uh, it's really looking at alignment. Uh, not, you know, there's not one program out there, one individual that only receives services from one program when they're in need. And so bringing all those services together, both for a better experience for our clients, but also bringing all the, that, those data points together to evaluate making decisions and knowing how people might be impacted by decisions at a, at a massive level, at a state level, is really critical. Um, I'm really excited. You know, startup is, is a very interesting time because it's a lot of trials and tribulations. So while I've been on board <clears throat> May, uh, May 4th, any Star Wars fans out there, May 4th is my anniversary for two years. However, our trailer bill to create CDI didn't happen until this past November. And, but we've been focusing on a lot of things during that time in terms of standing up the office. Uh, it's a consolidation of four offices that currently ex ex did exist at Cal HHS, bringing those resources together, retooling the team, and focusing on a couple specific initiatives. Our one that I wanted to speak to today, which is probably most relevant, is our Insights Lab. And I'm happy to have our Deputy Director over our Insights Lab, Elizabeth Stephenson, here to share with you just real quickly one of our other projects that we're working on, uh, our equity dashboard work. Uh, because we feel like a lot of these efforts that are happening in other areas of Cal HHS are really informing where the data is, what data do we need, and how, how can we work together to learn from each of these initiatives and leverage it here. So with that, I'll hand it over to Elizabeth, and I do apologize for having to jump off and attend another meeting, but I will be at uh, future meetings as well. Uh, Elizabeth, off to you. Awesome. Thank you, John. John and Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here with you today. Um, I, I'm very excited to share about one of the initiatives that, that John mentioned, our equity dashboard. Uh, we are at CDII incredibly interested in looking at how we can connect the dots between different programs, different projects, different efforts, and really support and encourage a leveraging of what resources are out there already established and currently being developed. So, um, the, the purpose of this overview is, is really to give you a sense of something that's happening right now. And uh, we really look forward to any feedback that you might have for how you might like to participate, how you might be able to leverage, how we might be able to uh, contribute to anything that, that this group is, is up to. So I am going to just share very quickly that the equity dashboard was was developed as, or was initiated really, as a result of the Inclusive by Design group that produced five recommendations around how we might support equity efforts across the agency. It eventually produced a budget change proposal which requested 7.5 million to support staffing and uh, funding for various equity initiatives. And one of those was actually a public facing dashboard to show outcome metrics towards racial and health equity. So we are in CDII supporting the development of this dashboard, and we are starting with um, looking at it from two different perspectives. One is knowing what we know and what we don't know. Right? So we often, we know everybody collects information, everyone collects data, it goes in all of our databases, but can that data talk to each other? Right? Can we do meaningful analyses between and across programs? And oftentimes the answer is no, unless each program is collecting and storing data consistent with some type of standard. Right? So the very first step we're going to be taking here is looking at what different departments and programs are collecting around SOGI data, which is, is a very specific part of um, of, of the equity picture, right? Mm -hmm. So we will be collecting, talking with different departments, getting a sense of what type of data you collect, how you collect it, and then moving toward an actual inventory to be able to show that in a dashboard for all of the departments to use. The second prong of this is we are expecting that the Cal HHS Chief Equity Officer and the JEDI Subcommittee mm -hmm. might be particularly well positioned to establish um, 
measures on how to drive health equity in a publicly accountable way. So as those measures get developed, we will be able to incorporate those into the dashboard and, and share them with others. So where we're at right now is we're really doing research and, and discovery. So um, departments will be hearing from us in the probably in the next few weeks here <laughs> to have an interview to talk about how you know what equity equity initiatives you may be working on, uh, what types of, of data you collect, and any opportunities or challenges that you might see in this area. Um, over the next month, we'll be developing a wireframe, just showing essentially a draft of what this dashboard might look like, and holding a couple of roadshows that will invite people to come in and provide feedback and say what works and doesn't work for them around the dashboard itself. We will be taking that feedback, revising it, and eventually producing the actual developed dashboard that should meet the needs of the departments that will be using it. So I'm happy to provide additional information if anyone has any questions, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share today. There. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Great. So we'll just, we'll move to, let's see. Is that what we wanted to I'm gonna do? do intros now, actually. Okay, yeah. We can go back. <laughs> I thought that was kind of out of order. Yeah. Um, can we go? Thank yeah, you, Elizabeth. Um, and now we're going to, um, here's our agenda for the day. This is how we're going to spend our time together. And I can't thank you enough for giving two hours to our first meeting. Um, we're going to go ahead and turn it over now to Sarah Steenhausen, who will be leading us for the remainder of the day and will facilitate introductions. So we, we know who's on the screen. Great. Well, thank you so much, Susan. It's such a pleasure to be here. I am super excited. Um, you know, we were tracking when I was at the SCAN Foundation as the master plan for aging was being developed. Um, you know, one of the uh, key efforts we had been tracking and participating in through um, Gretchen Alchemist's involvement from the SCAN Foundation is was the research subcommittee. And so um, we were thrilled when the research subcommittee developed their kind of recommendations and focus areas, one of which was the establishment of this research partnership, which we will hear about more um, when Terry and Amanda give kind of the background and context of why we're here today and what brings you all here. I know many of you had been engaged in that effort and some of you have not. So it's super exciting to be here with some new faces and with some um, uh, leaders who have been engaged for, you know, since the beginning. So we really appreciate your being here. And I wanna also call out before we do introductions, um, that's great, you can just leave this slide up. Before we do introductions, I wanted to note that, you know, initially this had been called the aging uh, research partnership. We felt, um, you know, consistent with our approach on the master plan for aging is we're really um, focusing on inclusivity with disability. And it's been a remarkable effort um, as the master plan has been developed um, that aligns older adults and people with disabilities, recognizing that, that we all are aging and that you know, there are many similar needs across the age spectrum when it comes to long term services and supports and related issues. So we are very pleased to have um, some new members today who um, represent uh, different aspects of the disability community. And I know we'll hear from Dr. Leonard Abadudo, as well as Ryan Easterly. Um, and we really appreciate your being here. So what I would love to do right now before we get into kind of the heart of our discussion and information today is to turn to each of you and have, I'm gonna walk through the list that you all see up on the screen so that I don't have to play, you know, go across the actual visual screen. You can figure out when you're gonna be doing your intros, um, your name, your organization, and what really makes you excited about being here today? What brings you here? And what do you hope to get out of the partnership? We're hoping to keep all intros um, you know, brief so that we can jump into the discussion, but just wanna thank you again for being here. So with that, um, we also will have our state staff briefly introduce themselves after you all go. So we'll quickly turn to any of our um, uh, participants who are here from our other sister departments, and thank you for being here. So we'll start with you, Dr. Abadudo. Yeah, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. So I direct the UC Davis Mind Institute, which is a research, uh, clinical care, and uh, training 
center focused on developmental disabilities. Uh, I am uh, a developmental psychologist myself, and my own research looks at kind of communication issues across the lifespan. I also have the good fortune of co-directing the Redwood Seed Scholars Program at UC Davis, which is the, as far as we know, the only four-year residential inclusive college program for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, and so that I'm really excited about kind of thinking of ways in which we can use healthier lifestyles, improved employment to really improve aging and people with developmental disabilities. So I'm really excited to be this in, in this group. So thank you for the invitation. Fantastic. Well, we're so glad you could be here. Thank you, Dr. Abadudo. And I would like to turn to my colleague and uh, uh, who's been long involved with this effort from the beginning and a, cre a key partner, uh, Dr. Zia Aga. Welcome. Thank you, Sarah, uh, and thank you, everybody. Uh, so Zia Aga, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of an organization called West Health. Uh, West Health really is an entity that, that includes a medical research arm, our institute, a policy center in Washington, D.C., and a foundation. And we're solely focused on advancing successful aging uh, for all Americans. Um, you know, I, in, in my role at West Health, I also oversee our data science and informatics efforts. And so I'm excited to see that as part of this research partnership, there's going to be opportunities to leverage data. But what really excites me the most is perhaps the idea that we will, for the first time, have data not just in silos, such as healthcare versus LTSS versus housing, but the ability to look across these data sets and really try to make connections for seniors because that's what they should be, you know, in terms of care, delivery, and services, they do not see this as a siloed world. Great. Thank you so much, Zia. And Gretchen Alkama. So great to see you, Gretchen. Thanks so much. Good to be here. Thank you, Susan, Sarah, and Amanda, and the whole team. Terry, I see you in there. Um, just so delighted to have uh, this partnership with you all. Um, Gretchen Alkama, Vice President of Policy and Communications at the SCAN Foundation. Um, and uh, Zia stole my thunder. I'm excited about um, the cross connections that the data will share. And uh, I guess maybe great funders think alike, right, Zia, <laughs> in that. And, um, and just, I'm super delighted that Jasmine's here with us as well today from the Funder Collaborative from the Archstone Foundation. Um, and uh, lots of good work. Sarah, back to you. Right. Well, thank you, Gretchen. As you know, the SCAM Foundation has been just so key in all of these efforts. So we really appreciate your time and effort and support of all of this. And now I'd like to turn it over to um, a wonderful colleague and leader in the caregiving space, uh, Dr. Donna Benton. Donna. Hi, thank you. I'm, you know, I'm at the University of Southern California uh, with this Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. And I, I think everyone just said what I was thinking is we're breaking down the silos of data. And so I'm excited about the data sharing, but in particular, um, I really want to be able to bring in new data that gets down to the community level and shows the impact of uh, the interventions, the education, all of those things that really make a difference for not for older adults and the families in which they live. So uh, I'm excited about bringing together both the older adult data, but data that impacts them from the from the people that are caring for them. So wonderful. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Donna. It's great to see you here. And I'd like to turn it to Isabella Chu. Welcome, Isabella. Thank you. Um, so. It's hard to express how excited I am about this uh, new consortium and uh, just the, the focus uh, both on data and the particular population. Um, I you know, just want to echo what everyone else has said. Without rich, complete, linkable data, it's very hard to answer the important questions um, and it's hard to get the right answer. And so this really presents the opportunity to do that, to answer the important questions and to get it right. Uh, so I, I share the enthusiasm for the data. I also really am excited about this population and, you know, things which affect uh, the elderly or as people age really affect all vulnerable groups. But the important thing about, you know, aging happens to us all. And so I think it's something that almost everyone um, who cares about vulnerable populations can relate to. And so I'm really excited uh, about improving the lives uh, the whole California population through the lens of aging. Great. 
Well, thank you so much, Isabella. It's great to have you here and representing the Stanford Center for Population Health Sciences and appreciate your being part of this effort. So now I'd like to turn it to a new friend and colleague, Ryan Easterly. Ryan, we are so appreciative of your taking the time to be here. Um, this was not an, uh, uh, I had been given Ryan's name as a great contact for this effort. And um, I really am excited to have you as part of this partnership um, kind of representing the disability community and foundation philanthropic world. So Ryan, welcome. Sarah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm Ryan Easterly. I serve as executive director of the WITH Foundation, and the WITH Foundation promotes comprehensive health care for adults with developmental disabilities. We do that by supporting organizations across the United States. I think what excites me most about being a part of this group is I think we all know that um, data can drive change. So I'm very I'm excited to dig into this data and again, break down some of these silos to um, use the data to create some change. I also very much appreciate how intentional this group has been about including the disability perspective because we know the disability experience occurs across the lifespan. And as um, someone who works for a foundation that looks at adults with developmental disabilities, it's sometimes hard to point out, you know, that many of the issues people with disabilities face occur throughout their life. Um, it's so easy for funders to just focus on um, our experiences when we are young people, but many of our experiences continue till much later in life. So I'm thrilled to be part of this group and thank you for having me today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's great to have you here. And now I'd like to have, um, turn it over to you, uh, Steve Hornberger from San Diego State University. Welcome. Yes, welcome. And ditto to everything that's been said already. Um, I'm the director of the, the newly launched uh, Center for Excellence in Aging and Longevity at SDSU. And over the summer, we also became an age-friendly university. So uh, I'm incredibly excited to be here to learn from other uh, stakeholders and what they're doing. The, the center, which is exciting, has created a regional a a aging research network. And what's interesting is uh, rather than get caught up in com competition, uh, UCSD and SDSU have agreed to have a, a faculty member be a co-chair and to make it representative and more community driven and partnered. Uh, the CEO of Meals on Wheels has agreed to be the third co-chair. So I look forward to sharing what's going on. And we've also begun, John uh, O'Hannon reminded me that uh, we're also partnering with um, CIE to begin to create a data, I, I keep calling it a data platform, and I know that's not the right term, but I'm not the technology person. And uh, where we are trying to have all the data so that we can begin to have data at both a at a client level, a program level, and a community level, because we want to be able to have data-driven decision-making actually be viable. And right now it's not for all the reasons that everybody has said already. And I'm, uh, and I apologize, I have to be, I have to drop off at 11 o'clock, but I will be here for going forward. Great. Well, we're just happy to have you here. And it's what an exciting effort you're leaving, leading at San Diego State University. I look forward to learning more about it. Um, a model for us all to consider. So now I'd love to turn it over to a tremendous leader in the field who's been just so impactful on a number of areas um, as part of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, um, Dr. Catherine Kiesman. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. So great to see you. Um, this is so thrilling. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. I lead the health equity program. My research is focused on the health and social care needs of vulnerable older adults and people with disabilities for, for many years now. Um, and, and this is just such an exciting opportunity to learn from each other, to collaborate, to, to walk across these silos that everyone's mentioned. I'm, I'm particularly thrilled about the integration and of, of disability into this discussion as it has been uh, throughout the course of the master plan. It just makes so much sense. Um, and, and I think it's particularly just credit to the state. I mean, this is, I, I feel like so many people in this room and, and outside of this room too, have worked on these issues for years and years. And this is a state led opportunity for us to come together and collaborate, to learn from each other 
and to solve problems, uh, you know, in this area collectively from all of these different perspectives that are in the room. Um, you know, uh, the I lead the LTSS um, study at, from UCLA, which follows on the California Health Interview Survey, and it provides population level information. Others in the room are experts in in program data. Um, we have experts from community who who can represent the voice of the consumers, the caregivers. So it's it's just the 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 marriage of all of these different perspectives and approaches that excites me most most about being. Um, invited to be part of this group. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And uh, we couldn't agree more. There's just so much potential with all of you here. And um, it's just exciting to think about what we're going to be able to get done together. So I'm really pleased that um, we also on our partnership, but who was not able to be here today is Dr. Margot Cashel, who's director of the UCSF Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative, and has just done a tremendous amount of work in the field of um, unhoused individuals, particularly impact on older adults. So she will be joining us for the remainder of the meetings, but could not be here today. So I am now pleased to turn it over to Jasmine Lock, Lock Samana, sorry, Jasmine, for butchering your name, um, of the Archstone Foundation, who's been also a, just a tremendous partner all the way through from the development of the plan and now through um, implementation. So welcome, Jasmine. Hi there, uh, Jasmine Lock Samana from Archstone Foundation. I'm a program officer. Uh, with the foundation and I'm really excited to be part of this group and um, bring uh, the, the philanthropic perspective, but also really excited just because um, this is such a, a wonderful group of people um, and excited about what can what's going to come out of this group, especially when looking at um, all of this data um, through that equity lens. So excited to be here. I'm excited to contribute and uh, looking forward to discussion. Wonderful. Um, and David, um, we are so, so impressed, David, that you're here because I didn't know that you were going to be here. This is Dr. David Lindemann, who's director at Citrus Health, who just had oral surgery and is so committed that he is listening in. So, wow, David, thank you. Um, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, David has been kind of a leading voice on all of this from the beginning. And once you can actually talk to us at our next meeting, or, or maybe in between meetings, um, we look forward to hearing more from you. So thank Thanks, you. For that. I'll put a quick intro in the chat and uh, save you all from not a pretty picture on uh, <laughs> video. Well, we really appreciate your commitment and uh, being here. You definitely get a gold star as Gretch put in the chat. Um, and now I'm pleased to turn it to Nari Re, um, who's director of the Retirement Security Program at the UCB Labor Center. Nari, thank you for being here. Yeah, hi, um, and I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I um, just just a, bit, a little bit about the labor center and the work that we do on retirement security. So we focus on economic security and aging, both in terms of preparing for that and then what happens uh, when people retire and don't have enough assets um, in the context of you know changing changes in pensions and social security and savings patterns. Um, I also work on long term care issues uh, from the perspective of the workforce. Um, I have to say, I, I had sort of missed the collaboration during the MPA, right, being able to talk with all of these really wonderful researchers on, on this um, really important issue of aging, and I'm looking forward to further collaboration, and also I'm really excited about working on data issues that are, you know, highly policy relevant. Wonderful. Well, we're so, so happy that you could be here, and now I'm super um, uh pleased to be able to introduce my former professor um, from the University of Southern California, Kathleen or Kate Wilbur with the Leonard Davis School of Gerontology at USC. Kate, you know, I have thought about you in this field for so long because you, uh, when I was at the Health and Human Services Agency, really kind of spearheaded this issue of the need for a data warehouse at HHS um, across aging you know, across the spectrum, bringing together all the data in one place. And at that point, probably 15, 16 years ago, it felt like it just was so far away and just there wasn't much appetite for it. And what's super exciting is hearing where we are today and hearing from John and Elizabeth at the Center for Data Insights at, at Cal HHS, 
making tremendous strides in this in this area and i really think it's something that's achievable and i credit you with kind of bringing this issue forward from the beginning and in so many other ways as well so welcome kate and we'd love to hear from you thank you so much sarah um i i'm kate wilbur and i am at the leonard davis school of gerontology and i direct the secure old age lab and i can't begin to tell you how excited i am about being here and about the leadership that is going on in the state of California with the master plan and being at the table with leaders in this area. And as Sarah said, I've uh, been at this for many years through a variety of initiatives. And I feel like uh, we're here. I think uh, Catherine made a lot of points about kind of the opportunities and the vision. And so I, I just can't begin to tell you how excited I am and how proud I am of what this state is doing with the leadership of all of you. And I really look forward to participating. Thank you, Kate. And I think it's, I think we all would agree too that it's very exciting the potential this all has, but we have a lot of work to do. And, and I think we're all ready to get going on that. So we um finally, we are so pleased that Heather Young, um, who's the Dean Emirata at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis and a real leader in the workforce area, healthcare workforce area, is also on the partnership, but she was unable to make it today. So we look forward to having her join us in our future meetings. So with that, we um, we've done our intros. I did want to just thank um, our colleagues, um, Marcel Wong from the Department of Developmental Services for joining us today, as well as uh, Juliana Vign Vignolotz, <laughs> sorry, Juliana, um, from the Department of Social Services. We're really emphasizing, you know, cross-department collaboration, and we will have other colleagues from um, across departments join us as well. Um, as you know, also from the Department of Aging, we have Amanda Lawrence, who will be speaking to us in just a moment, as well as Norbert DeAnda, who is on our uh, Master Plan for Aging Project team. So um, with all of that, I am so excited now to turn it over to the amazing Terry Shaw and Amanda Lawrence, who will provide a background and overview and a context for this work, the purpose and object objectives of this partnership. So um, we're, they're going to run through their slides, and then I'm going to provide a little kind of backup context for our efforts to develop research and policy um, unit at the Department of Aging. And at that point, we want to have a, a larger facilitated discussion on all of this. So if you have any clarifying questions when Terry and Amanda are speaking, go for it. Otherwise, um, your more substantive questions we'll have for our discussion component. So Amanda and Terry, take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. I am so thrilled that we're launching this partnership today, and I'm so grateful for your participation. I'm Amanda Lawrence, and I've been serving on this project team for a little over two years now. Um, many of you have been involved in the development of the Master Plan for Aging. You're still closely involved and have been monitoring the progress. And now we're happy to have you at this table, cross-cutting experts. Um, next slide, please. So we are almost a year and a half into implementation of our 10-year vision for building a California for all ages and abilities. Uh, in January 2021, the MPA was unveiled after 18 months of intense stakeholder and public engagement. As Nari just mentioned, it was such a great opportunity for folks to come together, explore issues, and problem solve. Um, included in this engagement was that research subcommittee that Nari served on as well as others on this partnership. And the governor's executive order that created the master plan also called for the formation of that subcommittee so that we ensure that the plan is not just driven by data and research, but also guided and measured by it. Um, and so I have included um, the research subcommittee's proposed research agenda in those meeting materials that you should have received for this meeting today um, for you to uh, review when you have an opportunity. Um, so the input that we received during the engagement process led to the development of five bold goals up here on the screen. So we have housing for all ages and stages, health reimagined, inclusion and equity, not isolation, caregiving that works, and affording aging. And each of these five goals includes three to five strategic areas that are in total driven by 132 initiatives, and that's just for years one and two. So um, in 2023, we will be unveiling our new strategic priorities and initiatives to drive the plan forward for the years to come. And we are so happy to have your voices at the table to help us develop and monitor those. Uh, next slide, please. 
So during the development phase, as I mentioned, we had um, the research subcommittee that was also accompanied by the long-term support, support services subcommittee, which is part of the stakeholder advisory committee that was also developed by the um, executive order of the governor. And we also had an equity work group to really apply an equity lens and support the other committees in developing recommendations that really did advance and ensure equity and aging. So we are now in the implementation phase and we have new um, stakeholder committees of experts and those are listed on this slide. So we are hearing from groups who um, are covering topics such as Alzheimer's disease, um, disability and aging, community living, so including long-term support services and transportation and housing. Uh, we have an elder and disability justice coordinating council, which launched just in January. And then we also have an equity and aging advisory committee building on that um, equity work group that um, assisted us during the development phase. And we also have the impact stakeholder committee who really provides um, oversight and um, some accountability to the master plan. It's comprised of nine leaders who are um, you know, state and national leaders in the aging disability and equity spaces. So each of these committees, of course, has their own set of research um, interests and data needs. And for example, the Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council is currently assessing gaps in elder and disability abuse data. Um, and so, of course, these data gaps exist in any number of these committees' areas of interest and focus. So the cross-coordination with these committees is really integral um, to identify research and data gaps um, across the committees. We can help leverage each other's resources. Um, and it's also just imperative to the sex success of all of the working bodies of the MPA. Um, so as this partnership, it evolves and we dig into the structure and purpose in the work, which we'll do throughout the remainder of these two hours. Um, we'll really work on making cross-cutting connections to ensure collaboration as we move forward. Um, and then here I have linked there the research agenda that um, the, the um, research subcommittee developed. I'm gonna pass it over to Terry Shaw, who's gonna talk a bit more about um, this committee. Terry has actually been involved with the master plan longer than myself and um, absolutely integral to this process. I just don't know that we'd be here today without her. So I'll go ahead and pass the baton to you, Terry. Well, thank you um, to all of you for being here and for so many of you who have been doing this work uh, for many years and specifically around the master plan for aging even for multiple years. So I really, I am so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be able to join you all here. I'm so excited to see how this work moves forward and the results that we're able to achieve together. Um, and and I, I am going to tell you a little bit about how we got here and why we're here, but before I dig into that, I do want to call your attention to a particular detail about what Amanda just shared. If we can go back to the prior slide and see the list of groups, great. The, what I wanted to point out here is that you'll notice that all of these groups, there's only one that has the word partnership in it. This is a partnership. This is really intended to be a working partnership. As so many of you have referred to um, during your introductions, we're excited about the collaboration. We're excited about solving problems together. So I, I wanna make sure that you all understand that while there is an advisory function to this partnership for where the state is eager to hear your input, um, it's about more than that. It's not just the state coming to you with updates and questions, it really is about working together to solve those problems. And so um, consistent with that, we're gonna talk about how we got here and more importantly, the, the purpose and, and the objectives of the group. But keep in mind that as, as I present all of this to you, this is a draft, this is a opening proposal and it is really open to discussion. We're going to have time for discussion on the agenda in just a, in a minute. Um, so please come with your thoughts, your responses, your ideas. Um, and really, we're hoping that together in this partnership, the stance here really is that all of us are engaged, all of us are working, all of us are action oriented and providing our leadership collectively to solve these problems. So just wanted to make sure, I think everybody's done a, a great job of, of saying that already, but I just 
from my perspective, having worked with all of you for so long and seeing what you can come up with when you work together, I just really wanted to reemphasize that point because it is, it is so important. Um, okay, so into the substance of, of what I'm here to share with you all. Um, first of all, just a little, a little background. Um, as folks have mentioned, this is uh, based on the, this meeting that we are having today and this group that we've formed today is directly in response to an initiative, one of those 132 initiatives that Amanda mentioned that is in the Master Plan for Aging. It happens to be initiative number 102 um, that calls for uh, facilitating a nation-leading research partnership on aging with California's university. As Sarah mentioned, we have very intentionally expanded that scope to be um, also inclusive of disability. Um, but this, this is something that is consistent with the work that the research um, subcommittee had, had done and the recommendations that they put forth, which included three main components. One of which, the first one of which was an advisory consortium, which is for all intents and purposes, what you all are here for today. There were two other components, which were about a university-based research alliance, alliance, sorry, and a data action center. So we really see this as a forum to help uh, sort of storm and norm around the, the goals and the objectives and drive additional work beyond the partnership per se. So um, this is not intended to encapsulate all of the recommendations that came out of the, the research subcommittee, but it's, a, it's an initial start to kickstart those bigger conversations and hopefully start to build relationships and infrastructure and a collaborative mindset to get them done. Okay, so um, the purpose, this, I'm going to, again, I'm gonna go over the purpose and the objectives. These are pulled directly from the draft charter that you all should have. Um, and, um, and these are, again, these are opening, uh, this is a starting point for discussion based on the discussions many of us, but not all of us have had to date. So open to further discussion later, but just to be very clear about the components that we see, there are really three key purposes for this partnership. One, of course, is to advance research, um, to promote equitable opportunities for Californians to thrive as they age. So promoting research, facilitating research is definitely a key purpose. Um, providing input on key performance indicators and data sources to the, the, the MPA outcomes report. So what are, how are older adults and people with disabilities affected by all the great work driven by the master plan. And then also the data dashboard for aging, which I have to give a big shout out to several people who are on this, um, this meeting, including uh, Catherine and Zia in particular, who have been working with us at CDA, CDPH, um, you know, the West Health Institute has been part of the work from the beginning to build this data dashboard for aging. We always know that it is a work in progress and we know that there are a lot of improvements to be made. So we welcome the input of this group to help drive um, some of the key decisions that we'll be facing on that front. Um, and sorry, go back one more time. There was a third purpose, which is I think also really important. And part of the reason that John and Elizabeth are here from CDII and from that agency perspective is that this is a research partnership that we hope can serve as a model for how the research community and the state policy community engage and solve problems together on a whole host of issues. So you all are, are really a, a, a test bed for how we do this kind of work together on a broader basis going forward. So appreciate that as well. Okay, our objectives, um, again, as I said, there is an advisory function for, for this group, um, particularly around that first outcomes report and the data dashboard indicators and targets, which of course will also be reflected in the report, um, and uh, serving as that lab learning laboratory to really figure out where there are additional research needs and opportunities. And maybe that will involve a research collaborative or a data action center. You all will help to drive that. Um, also, we are fortunate to be joined by 
uh, members from the funder community who have been partners with us all along on the master plan efforts. And through them and others, collectively, we want to be able to identify funding opportunities to support additional research efforts that we all identify as important. And then, uh, you know, again, serving as a model for achieving additional pri priorities beyond the MPA. So, Really, um, those, those are the uh, purposes and objectives we've identified collectively with you all in many cases, but we want to make sure that we have a rich discussion about these um, when we get to the dis discussion section. But first, Sarah is going to lay out um, more about how we advance this partnership um, and from the state's perspective, particularly around the um, the, the great new team that Sarah is setting up and the work that they're doing. So Sarah, back to you. Great. Well, thank you, Terry and Amanda, for that wonderful context setting and background. And again, um, we want to hear from you if you have modifications to the charter and think about you know, different angles for us to position this work and our efforts together. So just keep all your questions and, and comments um, at the front and center of your mind as we move forward. So um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how the state is developing its capacity to be able to build out its research and policy, policy and equity work. Um, so next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you a bit about the newly established Division of Aging, Policy, Research, and Equity. Um, the, the focus of our effort, broadly speaking, is to advance policy and research in line with the master plan for aging, but all with an equity lens. Um, this is a, you know, something that's really critical as we move forward. I know that we've all seen equity play out front and center over the past few years. And I think it was a good learning opportunity for all of us to think about the broader system issues to address and really putting an equity lens on all the work we do. So that's where our focus will be. Again, applying that equity lens that elevates older adults people with disabilities and caregivers across policy, program, and research efforts. Um, in our work at the Division of Aging Policy Research and Equity, we were, what's exciting is that this is not a typical division within a department that works solely on program issues within its department. We like to think of ourselves as silo busting. So we work um, not only with our colleagues at the Department of Aging, but we also work with our colleagues at the Health and Human Services Agency and other state part, um, other HHS agency partners, because you know, as we all know, aging and disability issues do not just impact one program, one sector. It's all of us, right? And beyond that, we're working across the agencies. So working with you know the housing and transportation, as well as um, labor and employment, labor and uh, workforce development. All of these issues impact aging. So um, as this slide shows. Um, in our team, we are building, <laughs> right now it's Amanda and Sarah and Norbert in our team, but we're really excited because we're about to start hiring um, to build out our team. So our first hire will be um, a, a key lead on our workforce initiatives and effort. So somebody to lead our work in the direct care workforce training and um, uh, uh, development program. So. In addition to that, we're really excited that we will have a chief equity officer, um, as well as a tribal liaison to lead our equity work that's focused not only on um, you know, how to promote equity within the program levels at the department, but also how to apply an equity policy lens to all the work that we're doing across research and policy. Second, we're really excited that we're building out a research team and hopefully within the next few weeks we will be releasing an announcement for a research data manager who will then hire a team of approximately four research um, assistants to build out a lot of the work that we're talking about here in this committee and to leverage resources with other partners. So we will be looking to you to help spread the word of that opportunity. It's really an amazing time to be here. So we're, we're excited to find a, a real strong leadership in this space. Third, we're building out a policy team. So obviously policy and research go hand in hand. Um, the policy lead will have a staff of about three policy analysts who will help identify and track and develop policy across not only the department, but in partnership with our other agency colleagues. 
And then last but not least, we have our master plan for aging team, which um, is led by Amanda who, Lawrence, who you've heard from, and who really what's exciting about that is that the MPA issues impact all of these efforts. So she also will be kind of cross-cutting in her work to oversee the implementation of the master plan for aging. So that's the structure of our work. And what I wanted to do is with all the information that you were given by Terry and by Amanda and understanding kind of how our resources are being structured at the department to build out um, the body of this work. We would love to hear from you right now. Um, and if you could turn to the next slide, um, there are a few guiding um, questions that we have for this discussion. And we really wanna make this as engaging and as possible. Um, I think we have approximately 45 minutes for this component of the discussion. So we wanna hear content and you know, feedback on how we actually make this effort successful. What are the critical issues that you in, in aging and disability research that we should be addressing front and center? What are the highest priorities? Uh, what is more broadly speaking, your vision of what this, if we were to look back five to 10 years from now, what do we want to say that we were able to do together, right? Um, and how can the partnership help the state realize its, its goal of building a California for all ages and abilities. So that's kind of the very macro perspective. Um, we're not gonna get as much into the structure and operations of the partnership right now, because Amanda is gonna be talking a bit about how we're going to structure our work of the partnership going forward. This part of the discussion is more on the content, um, the data research, the policy issues that you think that um, really Need, need attention front and center. I also want to note that, you know, what we didn't have time to do today is actually walk all of you through the data dashboard for aging, but we can put a link to it in the chat if you're not familiar with it for those who are new, because that's really, as Terry said, the data dashboard for aging is, is where you're going to be helping guide our thinking and helping us think about how we build it out further. We have a lot of work to do. But also along those lines is where are the key research efforts that we need to be thinking about. So thank you, Amanda, for putting that link up in the um, in the comments, and we can always pull it up online if we need to as we're talking. So with that, um, do we have anybody who would like to start out in reflecting on some of these? Um, you know, Zia, I'm thinking of you because West Health has been such an amazing partner in this space in helping build the data dashboard. I know you have a number of different um, issues that, that you all have been thinking about and would love to hear from you about what you see as the critical priorities and the vision for this work. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And then I'm gonna reflect on, you know, a meeting that we held, you know, and Terry and Kate and David participated in it. And, and we got some really good advice from both stakeholders from the master plan from aging, but other communities and researchers. And, and really there were three priorities or three sort of, I would say nuggets that I will draw from that, that workshop. One was how to make sure that the research and the researchers are policy informed. How do we make that linkage stronger? so that the questions and the issues that are gonna drive healthcare and, and public policy are front and center, and that we also speak in the language of policymakers as researchers, we often don't. So how do we, how do we improve those connections? Because if we cannot bring the data and its knowledge to the, to the forefront, we can't shine a light on the issues that we're all trying to address. Um, the other area that was we and, and the group talked about it earlier was this amazing opportunity to make linkages across different domains or different verticals, whether it's housing, LTSS, and healthcare. Um, that's difficult to do today, given the state of the data that we have. But I think that that's a that's an aspirational goal that we can all align on, and we can start to chip mm -hmm. away at. Uh, they did also gave us an advice that don't go down the path of starting to create your own new data warehouse, like leverage existing tools and data first, because building these infrastructures can be very expensive and very time time consuming. Uh, so their advice was to leverage sort of existing information. I think I, I'm aligned with that. And, and the model that we did with the, the dashboard on aging is exactly that, where we took existing data resources with the help of you know our colleagues at CDPH and Terry and CDA and other other you know UCLA, 
and have the, have sort of developed at least a baseline data resource that is going to help guide the work in the future. Uh, so, you know, I think I think those are some of the practical uh, points that that sort of I want to share with the group, but would love to hear from everybody else what they think, you know, where we should focus. That's that is such such helpful reflection, Zia, and I'm particularly, you know, I I love the way you framed how we can make sure researchers are policy informed, because I know we always talk about wanting to make sure that policy is data driven and research driven right. But at the same time, we need to make sure that that research has a lens that's grounded in the reality of the policy landscape so that's a really important consideration. Um, you know, Catherine i'd love to turn to you now because the contributions of the chest data over the last few years have really been significant both in the caregiver data that you've developed as well as the ltss um, data that's recently been released do you want to talk a bit about kind of some of the findings that that strike you about that work and how you see those data efforts um, you know what's the future of that and how can we best align the work that you're leading at chis the California Health Interview Survey with this effort. Thanks, Sarah, and and thanks, Zia. I like I love the three um, priority comments that you made about policy informed, and we do we do that at the Center for Health Policy Research to the best we can. Is that translation of research to policy language to policy, you know, to general uh, population audience, audi you know, audiences, um, and I think it's really 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 critical because whatever. Uh, you know, a treasure trove of brains come with this group, we have to be able to communicate in a language that, that in, you know, leads to good results. So I just wanted to first echo that. And then Sarah, thank you for, for raising the question. I mean, in terms of, of what we've been learning from the long-term service and support survey and the caregiver module in CHIS, I think it's, it's just a, um, really points to sort of the content area that I, I think could be overarching uh, when we think about different ways to communicate our research to policymakers. But I think of two, two words really just come to, to mind, unmet need as a starting point. It's, it's really about unmet needs. Um, however we approach it, whatever methodologies we use, I think we've been able to document that unmet need, some of the consequences of that unmet need. And I think the, that's the story that I think needs to go to the policymakers. Um, when I think about, you know, common sort of topic that could bring all of our efforts together, I think about equitable access to quality care, and and whatever the program, whatever the disability, whatever the frailty that brings somebody to that juncture in life, we need data to show where we have gaps. And then obviously the next step being using those data to encourage the filling of those gaps. Mm -hmm. And I think we need it from all of the different uh, sources that we've talked about and used for the data dashboard on aging. So uh, it really has to be a collective. Um, it really has to be a collective set of data in my view. Uh, we've talked about you know, person-centered metrics where we know what the consumer's experience is that's critically important to tell the story, but we also have to look across the aggregate numbers and the proportions of populations and the disparities by different racial, ethnic, other underserved population groups. We have to shine a light on those. Um, and I think that working together, we have the opportunity to do that. Just can't do it all. <laughs> you know, program data can't do it all. And, and, and just, that's really why this collaborative is so critically important to be able to answer those questions and to produce the evidence uh, that is informed. And I love that we need to be informed. <laughs> um, you know, I talk a lot about policy um, uh, research, sorry, policy uh, relevant research, um, but we do need to know what is you know, what type of data will be picked up by policymakers to advance the changes that are needed. And that translation piece is, is really critical. And again, it goes beyond much of what researchers are trained to do. <laughs> we need to work with the advocates and others to, to do that. 
Absolutely. So I love some of these themes that I'm hearing. Um, and, and you said it so well, Catherine, in your first statement about the importance of using data to drive equitable access to quality care. So we need data to measure access and data to measure quality, right? And um, also, you know, building on what Zia said, don't reinvent the wheel. Let's leverage the resources that we know are out there. And that's why partnerships like this are so important. Um, and how, again, to make ensure that uh, we have policy relevant research, but that we also have data driven policy. And that's something that Terry Valley Health and Human Services Agency is really emphasizing data driven and person centered. So we need to just keep that vision in line with where we're moving and don't have data just for the sake of having data, but using it, uh-oh. Okay, I'm gonna turn off my video because my connection's bad, hold on. Uh, use data to help drive um, a, a system that is better for consumers. So with that, I did wanna just point out a few efforts, Catherine, that are going on right now at the state that I think are really exciting because they get at this issue of how we measure access and where the, where the gaps are so that we can ensure more equitable access to services. First is um, an initiative that was funded through the um, Home and Community-Based Services Spending Plan, which was funded by the federal government through the American Rescue Plan Act. And it's, it's the uh, Long-Term Services and Supports Data Dashboard. Um, and I, I envision that we could potentially hear from our partners at the Department of Healthcare Services at a future meeting. They're leading this effort, but it's a really wonderful opportunity to bring together um, Medi-Cal home and community-based and institutional long-term services and supports data um, in one place for policymaking purposes and to help understand, you know, where we are across the in the system of care, both in terms of the data that we have and the data that we need to develop. Second to that and related um, initiative is called the Home and Community-Based Services Gap Analysis and Roadmap. Um, so the Department of Healthcare Services is leading an initiative to um, look at where the gaps are in services across the state for home, Medi-Cal home and community-based services. And from there, building kind of a roadmap for how we meet those access needs across the state. Um, something that's really exciting too, that we're uh, partnering with the Department of Healthcare Services on related to that, is we are um, at the Department of Aging trying to partner with them and put some resources towards expanding that gap analysis so that it's not just focused on Medi-Cal home and community-based services, but it, it's focused on, you know, other funded sources of home and community-based services, such as Older Americans Act funded programs, general fund programs, such as the Caregiver Resource Centers, um, et cetera, and housing and transportation. So we, um, we are working on some plans to try and build out that effort in partnership with Department of Healthcare Services. And what we envision and we hope to do eventually is build out a data map that can be utilized by policymakers and planners and researchers to actually visualize where the services are across the state. So you can see a visualization of the gaps and the redundancies, but also um, you know, where we need to, to build out a core set of services in the future. So I really see this group as being critical to all of that effort. Um, and if you're interested in speaking um, and providing input to the Department of Healthcare Services on their Right now they're focusing on their data dashboard. I'm happy to connect you with them because they're starting their stakeholder engagement process. So I just wanted to um, point that out because I think, um, Catherine, that you in particular and others on the line would, would probably have a lot to contribute to those efforts. So um, others that we haven't heard from, um, I'm just gonna look, I'm gonna start calling on people. Oh, good, we have hands raised. Donna, perfect. Thank you for raising your hand and then we'll hear from Isabella. Yeah. I, I mean, in listening to this, I, I like that we had the outline and I remember that meeting of let's use what we have um, and then slowly expand out. And, you know, I always remember it's not all getting done in one year. We have it's a 10 year plan. And so that's where we have to continue. The one thing that I think will be important to um, make our data come alive, even as we're looking at data is that we do have some qualitative 
um, data, way to capture qualitative information in a, a systemic way. I do qualitative research, so I really, you know, you can find a lot of very rich information that helps illustrate what you get out of the the demographic information and other information. So I hope that we do build across a way of getting some very good stories. That's, that is a really great point. And, and I'd love actually to have, before I turn to you, um, Isabella, and I saw Catherine, I think you just raised your hand again. Um, I, I wanna hear Terry, what are your thoughts on how we can begin to think about qualitative data in relation to the data dashboard for aging? Sure, uh, thanks. thanks for the, suggestion, Donna, and I have immediate ways to take you up on that. Um, very simple ways in the data dashboard, we have the ability to, in connection with any of the topics that are covered in the data dashboard, of which there are many, as you all know, um, we have the ability to link to additional resources and um, including, we can build out more attention to um, community voices or, you know, uh, individual voices. So we have space, if you will, in the dashboard to be able to do that on at least a awareness and sharing of resources basis. Uh, more broadly, on a more systemic basis, I think that's a rich topic of conversation for this group. But we have some immediate opportunities, so always feel free to send me resources, and I will find ways to, to make sure that they're um, accessible via the uh, through the dashboard. Great. That's wonderful. Love hearing these um, opportunities moving forward. So Isabella. Um, so, uh, sorry, put my hand down. Um, a couple things. So I, I completely uh, agree that building these things from scratch is extremely expensive and resource intense, uh, you know, time intensive, resource intensive. Um, and, you know, our team basically built a, a data warehouse from scratch um, and it costs millions of dollars in several years. Um, so just wanted to second that. Um, there are some resources for, um, you know, dashboards generally have to be available for public consumption. Usually researcher facing resources are much more uh, restricted, rich and granular. Um, so Google Data, Com we've been working closely with Google Data Commons and uh, somebody very high up at Google uh, has used his, you know, time, energy, and, and resources to curate a lot of publicly available data sets uh, for the purpose of overlay with health data to make inferences about you know, environmental exposures and health. And uh, that is easily available and importable into a dashboard. Um, certain area, things like wildfire, I mean, no, there are environmental exposures, which we deal with a lot. Primarily wildfires is the one that's been most front of mind, um, but those are very useful resources. Um, and I also wondered, it, this is more of a question, um, what kind of data schema we're using? Is there a particular common data model that this is being done? Is it just being, you know, standardized uh, from a, a homegrown version? I, I'm just curious about the common data model. That's why I'm so glad Terry's here, because I would just stare at you and say, I have no idea. Um, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is, this is where our colleagues at CDII um, can be incredibly helpful because they are helping to lead some of those, the, the standards for um, state data exchange. And then also um, David Lindemann, who, please don't talk, David, I'm not asking you to talk. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible <laughs> but, I, <for> that. <laughs> but I know that David is, uh, as he put in the chat, is actively engaged in the um, data exchange framework that is currently being in, uh, built out statewide. And so there are just multiple initiatives that are going on simultaneously that we really wanna make sure that we can um, both contribute to informing the development of those standards and those efforts, but also serve as something of a use case for them because oftentimes as people have discussed already, the um, equity data and the age-based data that and disability data that we are really focused on in this group is sketchy at best um, in in some of these data sets and even in thinking about the standards so um so i think this group can help contribute to those all those efforts as they're moving elizabeth i didn't know if there was anything else that you wanted to say about all of that yeah that's great um 
I, I think I, I have it actually a, a slightly non sequitur thing I'd like to share, kind of going back to qualitative data, if that's okay. Um, so I, I wanted to, to just briefly comment on one of the ways, and I don't know, Donna, if this is what you were specifically thinking of, that we have been able to use qualitative data in dashboard development, which is to start our processes, whatever, whatever that might be, with interviews with the data providers so that we understand more of what they mean when they're using terms. This is a, a bit beyond just data dictionaries. This is really understanding, you know, what does this concept mean to you? How do you use it? And uh, we have found, especially in the state, I think everybody here knows that, that uh, the data and the, the terms that are used are incredibly nuanced um, and often don't actually have definitions. And so we think of something and we think, oh yeah, well that, that means X, but, but it doesn't. Um, and everyone has kind of a different definition of it. And so we've been able to interview and use sort of the emergent understanding of what is meant by a particular term to make sure that the data that we're framing is really accurate. This is really what we're saying. This is what it means. And that we can capture some of the challenges and concerns that, that also show up in those interviews. So I, I, I did want to sort of underscore that and um, appreciate the value of it in developing. That's an incredibly thoughtful and thorough approach. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for jumping in and um, you know providing that that context as well. Zia, I see your hand raised, and then there, uh, oh, Kate, I see yours, and I'll call on you next. Thank you, Zia. I, I just wanted to sort of uh, reflect on what Donna was saying, and and one of the ways we have brought qualitative data, and I know Scan does this also, is by doing public polling. And the polls can be short, they can be targeted, they can be very timely and have tremendous value in informing policymakers. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's something we could consider um, as, a, as, a, as a way to round out some of the more qu quantitative data that has been collected through other sources. It's mm, a great thought. Thank you, Zia, for that. Appreciate that. Um, so Kate Wilbur. Uh, so a couple of thoughts and um, echoing what people have said. One is just recognizing what a heavy lift this is, how long we've been at it, how complicated, how many different sources of data to link. Um, and then the big data technology piece, which I think is really important, the gap analysis. But I also want to return to the qualitative part. And uh, I, I was struck, uh, Catherine knows this, I've talked about it before, an IHSS study they did coming out of the Olmsted Committee which was qualitative data and stories. And we talked before in another group about capturing the lived experiences of older adults. And policymakers, of course, understand and love stories. And so thinking about Zia's idea of research and policy link, but I think it's almost a triangle. The third piece is the consumer focused lived experiences and maybe even going to ideas like co-design uh, mm -hmm. having and and user stakeholders at the table in knowing what research questions we should be asking so thinking about sort of those intersections and how we bring them together and i know uh gretchen and i have been working on a group that's looking at that as well how you bring key stakeholders to the table for their input. So uh, just wanted to sort of reemphasize what you all are saying in terms of those thoughts. Thank you. I love this. The little, I see like a little trifecta of uh, research policy, research that's informed by policy, policy that's informed by research, and all of that is informed by the consumer lens and their engagement of, you know, how you can develop in a way that resonates with what really matters to the person. So um, thank you so much for that. And I'm great, love to hear from you, Dr. Abaduto. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I just wanna follow up on a couple of things. So I'm not a policy or a big data person as a psychologist, I'm more at the individual level. And I just wanna mm -hmm. kind of reemphasize uh, what Kate just said and, and Donna and others that I think the stories are really important at the individual level to help illustrate the impact of policy and data. And so uh, I think it really is important for us to look at the qualitative data. And then I think the other thing, I love Kate's idea about having people involved, uh, kind of the consumers as partners in addressing some of these research questions. We've continually uh, in our own work, tried to listen to self-advocates with disabilities 
and we're often surprised that their priorities don't align with ours all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you know it's nice to be um, open and and to to recognize that we don't know everything. And I think having consumers at the table is really going to be important. So I just want to echo what Kate said. Such an important point. It's so easy for us all in each of our line of work to think that we know the perspectives, right? But then when you step back and actually listen to people, it's I always find that I learn a lot more and I realize how much how little I actually know. So I think that's true for policy and research components. So thank you for that important reminder. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking um, I would love to hear, you know, uh, let's see, Nari, Nari Re. You have a focus a lot on retirement security and would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, from that perspective, where you see some key opportunities that kind of intersect with, with what we've been talking about. Um, yeah, I've just been really enjoying um, the discussion so far about qualitative data. Um, the, let me just get my head together here. So um, I'm thinking about sort of the intersection between kind of survey data um, and administrative data. So one of the things I'm, I'm sort of uh, focused on is um, how do we how do we predict trends right in in the needs of seniors right given all of the dramatic sort of changes that are happening in California demographically um, and economically, right? In terms of the kinds of supports um, and resources people have going into retirement. So for instance, you know, there's a Cal Savers program, which launched a few years ago and is sort of slowly accumulating assets. And, um, um, and then and at the same time, there are people who, who really sort of fall into the gap. So, you know, given that my focus is on retirement readiness, I think, one of the things is like trying to figure out what are some indicators that you can collect that are actually sort of prospective. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a that's a really important point to think about how we can instead of waiting to see what the you know tying lack of retirement security to poverty, what are some of those indicators before so that we can try to. Um, address the, the the challenges that people face. Um, so thank you for that. Um, really important considerations, particularly in terms of our goals to fight poverty and help people afford aging. Um, one thing that came to mind that I wanted to highlight that David mentioned in the chat um, is the importance of social determinants of health data and that we often have clinical measures, but we, uh, Isabella responded to, you know, David was saying that we really need to focus on that as a key area um, to build out. And Isabella, you um, noted that you're working on validating a small measure of social determinants of health. Do you want to talk a bit about what that is and what how you think it could be applied to sure. our um, So we actually, uh, the Stanford Center for Population Health Sciences actually has a partnership with the American Board of Family Medicine. Um, and there are what's called um, small area measures of social de social deprivation indices. There's ones used by the CDC and by um, physicians and in the healthcare setting. And usually they're at the census tract level. And so we have a data set of about 7 million individual level EHRs. Uh, we just got approval yesterday to import the entire state of Colorado data as well by individual. Uh, these are claims data. So we have uh, 7 million EHRs four and a half million uh, claims. And then we've applied for the full Medicare and Medicaid data uh, sets, uh, which we intend to bring into census as well. So we're gonna bring all of these data into census and link them by individual. And then we're gonna do a head-to-head -head compare it. Well, we have three aims. One is we've got imputed race. And so we're gonna see where imputed race is accurate and under what circumstances and then be able to adjust for that and so that will be useful for all kinds of things because you have to adjust for race and so many of these kinds of analyses and then the second primary aim is to do a head-to-head -head comparison between these small area deprivation indices and they're usually by census tract um, sometimes they're by five digit zip and into individual level uh, social deprivation indices. So in the census, we're gonna link their health data to um, all kinds of census data. Um, our priors are that 
below a certain income, it probably matters a lot. Um, and, you know, if you're making 80, 90, 100,000 a year, it kind of doesn't matter where you live very much. Um, and that's, uh, that's our prior. We don't know that that's true. So once, so we have these small area measures now that you can just import and, you know, I can send them to Zia now and he can just overlay them and import them into the dashboards. Um, and then by 2023, 24, we'll be able to calculate them by individual and know how to adjust these small area measures um, for certain kinds of you know, certain populations or individuals. Um, so it's really precision population health. Wow, that's incredible. That was really a long-winded answer. I'm no, sorry. I, I love this and I love you had because it's like, can we use this data for the dashboard and and you know uh, how how might we do that? So Terry, I'd love to turn to you to think about how we build on these efforts and uh, translate it, you know, to forwarding our data sets. Well, I, I think this is a great example of leveraging what we have, right? And um and so really the preferred way that I, in general, the data dashboard works is that we identify based on the goals of the master plan, what are the key indicators that will help us know whether we are achieving those goals and then do the best we can to get the right data to um, present to allow people to see that kind of result. So I think what we should probably do and see I'm looking at you too is we can probably set up uh, a side meeting. And so this is a great example of what I meant before when I was talking about working partnership. We can set up a side meeting to dig into the details of what is it that would be useful from us through a master plan lens? What do you have? Line those things up. And then Zia and his team and, and others that we have at our disposal can work on actually bringing it to life. So Zia, what do you think? No, I couldn't agree more, Terry. I, I think this is the magic of bringing this group together uh, and the data dashboard is really it's a living sort of platform it's growing uh, the team has been working hard to update the existing measures but adding new functionality and this yep. could be a very cool function to add yep where you could sort of cut across those domains yep. yeah it's it's wonderful and you know um i i think we all you know something that terry said when the data dashboard got released is this is just the framework and it's living. And even since you released it, Terry, in uh, early of 2021, it's developed enormously since then. So it's it's really exciting to see it evolve. Um, and I want to turn to Gretch now because Gretch, um, TSF, and I know West Health, but TSF has been working a lot with um, with. Okay, Susan <clears throat> has been working with the Office of Medicare Innovation and Integration um, at the Department of Healthcare Services, which is a really exciting new um, office at DHCS for those of you who are not familiar with it, that's focusing on understanding California Medicare beneficiaries, their needs, the gaps in services, where it aligns with Medi-Cal, and so that we can really build out state leadership in the Medicare space, which has never happened before. And the SCAN Foundation has funded um, some data development as part of that effort. And I know that West Health is as well. So we'd love to hear from both of you about how you envision that data, you know, it intersecting with this work and what you think the real priorities are there. Sure, thank you so much, Sarah. And we're really pleased to be obviously um, deeply involved in Master Plan for Aging effort, um, as well as one of the key initiatives of the Master Plan around uh, helping really upstart the Office of Medicare Innovation and Integration inside of the Department of Healthcare Services. Um, the focus of that office is, is really kind of considered as a strategy hub inside of DHCS. So being able to do the connections inside of that department, but also critical connections inside of um, places like CDA, like Department of Insurance, like Department of Managed Health Care, like uh, you know the, the benefit side of state employment, um, given that so many CalPERS beneficiaries uh, end up uh, utilizing Medicare Advantage plans, right? I mean, that, that state's a huge purchaser of Medicare services as well. So uh, being able to have this core that's thinking a lot about what's on the Medicare side, obviously for things like integrating care for duals um, is important, but there's many, many other tentacles. And, and so the beginning point of this work that 
Uh, we've been doing with ATI Advisory out of Washington, D.C., as well as the Center for Healthcare Strategies um, and the AP NORC Center, is to give some early information, early analytics, um, and allow the office to really absorb what do we know about Medicare beneficiaries from kind of core basic data, as well as from polling data. Um, you know, Zia and I are always linked together on that because we know that hearing directly from people really matters to interface mm -hmm. um, with these large data sets. Um, and so there, I'll pull up the link about what the first chart book is that's already available through the Office of In um, Medicare Innovation and Integration. And there are many, many more chart books that are planned at this point. And that's using um, you know, national data uh, sets that are looking particularly at California and being able to understand basic characteristics of beneficiaries. Where do they live? How many are in Medicare Advantage? Uh, you know, how many of them have caregivers um, and daily needs from the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey. So lots and lots of richness about what that information is. And I think the spirit of it is, is we're pulling a profile of aging Californians. This is one big um, aspect of that architecture that can be informative inside the broader data dashboard, as well as the broader thinking about what are the most critical initiatives to be tackling as part of um, both master plan for aging overall, but what are those research needs that big data is never going to tell us and talking to people particularly on the ground isn't going to tell us because there's a, a lot of elevation between those two platforms um, that have a lot of research implications for community services and supports on the ground. Um, Catherine and I talk about that all the time and about what is CHIS doing to really fill a lot of those gaps for people um, as well as how do you intersect that with um, what does that mean for the community-based infrastructure that's available? So, um, you know, it's just a beginning place, I think, of understanding the Medicare side of the lens. Certainly not everything, but it tells you a lot about what's happening in California's aging population. And so, um, Zia, I'll turn it over to you. Um, just know there's only one chart book out, but there are a lot more stuff is coming in about the next six to eight weeks. Awesome. Gretchen, thank you. Like, I mean, I, I won't add much more. I think Gretchen gave a great summary of this effort. I would just like to shine a light on the sort of what we call and, and all of you call the sort of the forgotten middle. Yeah. So this work is going to really help us also understand that population that is not yet met the Medicaid eligibility, but is one healthcare crisis away from from ending up in that situation. And how do we start to look at them? What services do they use? Uh, and what are their challenges? So I think that's some of the work we're focused up with uh, our partners at HMA uh, to really start to describe that that population that is not yet in the dual pool, but could be, and then be more forward looking as we think about the MPA and the programs and and its outcomes. Great, that's that's fantastic. Thank you, Gretchen and Zia, for that. Um, and I think it, it does raise in a very important point, which is, you know, the master plan for aging is it's a plan for everyone. So um, it's older adults, people with disabilities as they age. And that includes, as we said, the broader population beyond Medi-Cal. So while it is very important to get an understanding of Medi-Cal and the needs of people who are on Medi-Cal, we also wanna be upstream too and understanding, you know, where are those people who are in the missing middle and where are their needs and how can we better meet their needs in a more integrated fashion and how can we utilize data to get us there? So um, it's exciting to think about, you know, we are working with DHCS closely, Department of Healthcare Services and Anastasia and her team to begin talking about how we can leverage some of this data for data dashboard purposes and we'll be turning to all of you um, to, to help guide our thinking on that. Um, one thing I just want to ask Crutch too, I know that um, they had done some work to do polling work as you mentioned of the Medicare beneficiaries. Do you know if that data will be publicly available and what the timeline is? Yeah, the goal is to have that report out um, in May, Old Americans Month, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we're just getting the details on that and final touches now, there's a lot of depth inside that report. So um, we anticipate that there'll be a report that comes out, but then a lot of different ways of kind of slicing and dicing that information in order to make it visually appealing. And um, the last thing I'll say about that survey is that it's we, we chose to take a step away from the 65 line as kind of obviously yeah. um, in many ways, you know, a traditional time point in people's minds about Medicare. Um, but in order to capture younger people than 65 with disabilities who are already on Medicare, 
as well as people who are going to be aging into Medicare soon, we dropped that poll down to 55. Um, and, and, and I think doing that, we just kind of opened up the world of what some of people's expectations are of Medicare, as well as people who are already using it, who are under 65. So a um, lot of dimensions in there. Again, this is population-based polling, getting people, you know, who are um, speaking right from the heart. It is not anywhere near the awesome stuff um, that Nari and Catherine do. Um, but I think what it does is it gets the sentiment about what people are feeling about Medicare right now, which is, which drives a lot of behavior. So um, even drives Susan's dog's behavior, right? Yes, yeah, Susan, so, I just want to check in and make sure Susan's okay. It looked like she was getting trampled by this dog but, that uh, often comes in in the meetings. It's very entertaining. Which I love. So, all right, back <laughs> and, to and you. And I, I did see, Kate, you had a big black cat on your lap as well. Amanda also has a big cat that frequently makes visits onto screen. So um, it's always fun seeing that. So. Thank you for that, Gretchen. I think that's a perfect um, example of utilizing some more qualitative type data to really get a pulse on what where the person is, but then also coupling it with the important macro level data that's also being developed. Um, so I just, you know, I'm cognizant of time. We do we did set aside some time for public comment, but honestly, there's no members of the public here. So we're going to keep going with this part of the discussion for a little longer, um, if that if that works for everybody. Um, and before we close up, we're going to also, uh, I think maybe we'll go for about 10 minutes, because then Amanda is going to talk through kind of the structure of our work moving forward and how we want to operationalize it. And then we'll have some thoughts about next steps before we close up. Oh, um, OK. It, I'm sorry, I, there are members of the public, so we will have time for public comment no matter what. I don't want our public members to think we won't. We will definitely reserve that, but we're just going to kind of go on for about 10 more minutes as part of this discussion. I just want to highlight some of the themes I'm hearing because I think it will work into how we might want to structure our work moving forward in these key areas. One that rises to the top is how we can really focus on this consumer-focused data um, and you know highlighting lived experiences and ins ensuring that the end user is included in thinking through um, priorities and you know that could look many different ways and and how we use that uh, to populate you know the data dashboard but also just for our own uh, research needs um, and including within that looking at stories and the impact of policy um, on the person. Um, also talking about, um, you know, looking at some of our current initiatives and how they might align with the data dashboard. That would be the HCBS gap analysis and roadmap and getting your thinking on that, um, as well as this uh, LTSS data dashboard and ensuring that we have an equity lens applied throughout. And then also looking at um, SDOH data and opportunities to work with our partners at, um, at Isabella's shop at Stanford to think about how we align the great work they're doing um, with the data dashboard, as well as the work that's coming out of our Office of Medicare Innovation and Integration. Uh, so that's kind of general things I've heard. Um, I wanna see um, kind of, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to look around the screen and make sure we're hearing from everybody and I don't wanna put anybody on the spot, but Ryan, I'm looking at you. And Ryan said to me when I talked to him the first time, he's like, you know, I don't, I'm not a researcher. So like, I, I'm not a data person. I said, well, I'm not either. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the programs, you know, the population, you know, the needs, you know, a lot about the system. So I would love to hear any reflections you have on where we are and what your, any thoughts are you have on how we might be impactful in our work. So I have been sharing my thoughts through the chat. So I do want to okay. um, share that and, and so have many other folks. So um, please make sure you're paying attention to the chat because there's some good conversation going on in there as well. Um, I would echo what many others have, have raised today. Um, I think there um, is an opportunity to make sure that we're elevating the experiences of those with multi-marginalized identities or multi multiple historically resilient identities as much as possible. Um, from the disability perspective, we know disability identity crosses all other forms of marginalized and historically resilient identities. So as much as we can talk about the data in ways that, you know, breaks the silos as opposed to trying to fit people into them, mm -hmm. 
um, I think it will help the work. And as much as we can uplift um, and find ways to elevate using community participatory research, um, if possible, I think that would be great and helpful to the community. Fantastic. I love it. And thank you for um, also calling attention to the chat. We will keep a recording, you know, a log of all the chat and um, look at it afterwards just to kind of um, jog our memories on all of that. So I appreciate that very much. And, and a very important uh, point about ins ensuring that we're working, uh, not putting people in boxes, but thinking across, um, you know, what that means across the populations and, um, and with an equity lens, of course. Um, okay, so I want to turn now to, I'm thinking that, um, you know, Terry, what are your thoughts as we're kind of hearing all these great uh, efforts that are underway and, you know, emphasizing the importance of leveraging data? Where do you see the near-term priorities for the next step in terms of um, building out the data dashboard and some of our opportunities? Well, I think um, two of the themes that you just identified, we can start working to figure out ways to build them into the dashboard now. So the um, community-based research, qualitative research um, is one, and another is, of course, the um, social determinants of health. So um, I will be reaching out to folks for some follow-up conversations, and my, my thought is that um, we can have some side conversations, be doing some work in between meetings yeah. in order to identify some things to bring back to this group and in future meetings, maybe dig in collectively on some of the, the particular questions that we've come up with or challenges that we're running into or what have you. So um, that's where my mind immediately goes because I, I, I want us to be action oriented. So um, that, that's where I'm going. So. Uh, folks can look forward to hearing more from me offline, and um, and I also welcome all of you to reach out to me about any ideas you have on that front, because um, we have lots of gaps in the data dashboard already, some of which we have already identified, and Nari, I'm looking at you because retirement security is one of them. We have a placeholder for retirement security measures. would love to work with you to build those out, um, and then... Um, there's clearly plenty more that that we could tackle. So um, really appreciate everybody's willingness to engage. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, no, I love that idea and I couldn't agree more. You know, as Amanda pointed out, we have about seven different advisory committees and it's it's interesting moving from, you know, I was a stakeholder on the outside in the development of the MPA. Now on the in, now that I'm working with the state and we've shifted to implementation of the MPA, the, all of the advisory committees kind of have to shift the type of work they do as well. And our, I, the kind of ideal that we're striving for is exactly that, Terry, where people convene in between and bring their recommendations, ideas, and thoughts to the next meeting so that it's you bringing your, you know, the collective work forward rather than us just reporting out. So um, I think that's a, a great approach and focusing on both the quality data, qualitative data um, with the community focus on, on the person, um, and then secondarily building out the social, social determinants of health data. Those are the kind of two buckets I'm seeing. Um, and what we would do is we would be sure to send out an email um, to everyone and saying, if you want to be part of this conversation, let us know. And Amanda will talk a bit about kind of how we operationalize that, but but we will make sure anybody who wants to participate in that um, can do so. So Zia, I hear, I see your hand. And then um, if there's any last comments, we will then move to Amanda to talk a bit about our process and structure of the um, group. Sarah, uh, I do wanna take the opportunity to sort of gauge the group's interest and thoughts on an issue that was raised in, in previous conversations. And this is around capacity building or leadership. Um, the idea of having either some form of trainees or postdocs or whatever, you know, you've got such amazing academic institutions, amazing opportunities within the state organizations and your shop and OMI and others. Um, any ideas and thoughts on how do we sort of, you know, help train the, the next set of leaders uh, for this work? Great. I love that. And, and that's something we're talking about, too, just in general 
about building policy leadership, right? It, with an equity lens of, of making sure that we have emerging leaders that are coming out of school and graduate school um, with, you know, from a range of backgrounds. And I think that applies to the research as well. And I love that idea um, to start building out research leadership. So, um, okay, um, with that, um, see some great comments about that as well. Um, we'd love to turn to Amanda to take it, take us to this next discussion um, briefly on our operational aspects of the, what we call CATERP, which is the Aging and Disability Research Par Partnership. Yes, all right. CATERP, CADERP, however you want to <laughs> pronounce it. Um, just a few logistics here and just to talk about how we want to continue to meet as a group. So on the next slide, um, you'll see that you know, our anticipation is that this group, this partnership would meet on a quarterly basis as an entire um, council or committee. Uh, but as we've talked about during this, and so many themes are organically arising as to what would become more of a member-led work group where work gets done between the meetings, where all that action really happens. So again, anticipation, quarterly meetings, just like this one, two hours long. I've actually already sent out, I think, two additional um, invitations to you, so those should be on your calendar. And um, we'd love to, you know, find a way, maybe it's during this meeting or maybe offline, you know, how are we going to form these groups? We've already ident identified social determinants of health, qualitative data, perhaps research data. So what are our key priorities right now that we want to start advancing and how do we want to go about organizing ourselves between those, these meetings? Um, of course, we're, for now, we're going to continue to meet virtually. Um, we're going to continue to have you know, these meetings available to the public. We post all of the materials online. So um, we'll have that available as a, as a matter of public record. And then um, you know, we'll always record these meetings as well. So um, that's just the foundational logistics is how we are envisioning the structure right now. Um, and of course, here are guiding principles for the meeting with you wonderful folks, I don't anticipate that we would have any challenges like um, members consistent attendance and active participation. I know I can rely on all of you for that. Um, collegial environment and allowing for expression of diverse and innovative points of view. Already heard several of that, to, a lot of that today. Um, we really wanna support open communication and active collaboration between the members of this committee and um, California Health and Human Services Agency. And you know, as we've talked so much about today, it's really about the consumer, the person-centered focus, data-driven equity lenses are sort of the primary um, values that we really hold up for the Cal HHS's guiding principles. Every um, committee and work group that we've been um, convening for the master plan for aging, we've really been pushing that lens of this is about the people we're serving. It's how they are um, benefiting from and going through these systems. It's not just about a program or a service. Um, uh, so many implications related to data for that concept, though. Um, so that is um, I'm, where we can have a little bit of discussion. I think we have a few minutes. If anyone does want to dive into uh, how we go about organizing between meetings, um, is there a, a platform we can share? We can all be on um, where everyone has access to it between meetings. Um, you know, several of you have gone through beyond that, that research subcommittee, so you know what it's like to uh, dive in and get the work done uh, between meeting with the state. So um, want to hear from folks. I see it. Zia has his hand up and I'm happy to hear. No, Zia no longer has his hand up. Um, <laughs> but do you just want to emphasize what Terry had said earlier? This is truly a partnership and it's truly about your expertise. Um, you know, the master plan for aging is not just about what the state is doing. It's so, it extends beyond so much, so far beyond um, just state leadership and, and state program policy and systems. So um, really diving in is imperative to advancing this work. I'm looking over to see if anyone has their hand up. Amanda, I have a thought, which is, <clears throat> I think just we can make this pretty simple and send out a follow-up email to, and for people to respond back and say who would like to be part of which discussion or do we want to make it one big discussion. I think it sounds like there's enough substance in the social determinants of health and the qualitative data that we probably want to make it too, too separate. Yeah. So uh, we will, our team will work on getting a note out about that. 
Um, and of course, in the meantime, if you have other thoughts, let us know. I'm also thinking that at our next agenda, would you all be interested in hearing from our colleagues at the Department of Healthcare Services on the LTSS data dashboard initiative, as well as the HCBS gap analysis? I think this is a really great group for them to hear from. Yeah, okay, yes. fabulous. That, that I will put on the agenda. Good, well, we already have a little framework for an agenda. Yes, um, I wanna emphasize, please send us agenda items and your ideas. This is uh, more about what you want to share than what we want to share. I saw, I think I saw Donna put her hand up. No, I, that was a, a thumbs up, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Donna approved idea. Oh, I see Onari, yeah. Um, you know, what would help me is, um, the scope is pretty huge right now. And one of the things I'm curious about is like, what are sort of the burning questions coming from the agencies working on this issue and, and also the advocates working on this issue um, just as a way to focus? Um. Yeah, that's a, so so more like from your what you're asking is where are the prior the key priorities right now at the agents health and human services agency. Yeah, for yeah. instance. Yeah. And that's a yeah. great question. I'll turn yeah. to you, Elizabeth. Do you have um would you like to try? I know equity as you described your equity landscape that your the equity dashboard that you're working on. Um, but do you want to talk a bit more about where you see the key data priorities right now? It's a, it's a great question, and I think I'm, there are so many, <laughs> I think is where, where we're really coming at right now. Um, one of the places that we're focusing on, and, and really the core of everything that we're focusing on, is how can we make it easier for departments to share data? Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is really where um, all other things are kind of stemming from, from, you know, the importance of establishing a data catalog to, um, having a technical system in place for departments to be able to not only share but also analyze data um, if if and when it's appropriate for that to be in a sort of a centralized place as opposed to you know one specific department's home um, i think there are a number of others i'm not really prepared to speak to all of them today but i i think that i would really just emphasize that this is really about making data sharing easier so not to step over any of the security or privacy or confidentiality, all of that has to be there, um, but it, it should be uh, not so hard. Um, and I will put a link up to the data, the health information exchange. There's some recent, there was a couple of good articles that just came out recently on it. Um, one in the Cal Matters of explaining kind of what it is and that might be helpful to this group to see as well. Okay, uh, Kate. Yeah. sorry. Oh. One quick thought, uh, there's so much richness here and, and the, the challenge is huge, but can we think about small wins, how we kind of get some stuff under our belt to move ahead and how we break things into some discrete small kinds of ways forward um, and what those might look like for us to initially start with. Yeah, I mean, to me, Kate, I agree. And I think that the two that step out to me is, is how we start uh, thinking about um, linking the data set that Isabella highlighted and that has some connection to social determinants of health with our data dashboard. I think that's a doable, it sounds. Um, it might not happen overnight, but it's doable. And second, um, you know, uh, whether we can start collecting some of the kind of consumer focused uh, qualitative data that's already out there and, and how we might link that to the dashboard. Those are two thoughts I have. I, Terry, I see your hand up. Why don't you respond to that good question and any other insights you have? Sure, yeah, and I, I agree with those two, you know, sort of initial shots, but I also want to propose to you all um, in response, Nari, to your question, um, should we find a way to have this group really reflect on maybe using the lens of the outcomes report that we are working towards, the MPA outcomes report that we will be generating, to really start focusing in on what are those key outcomes that from a research perspective 
and certainly from a person perspective and a policy perspective, what are those key outcomes that we want to focus on for that first report? And what data do we have available to help inform that? And to the extent it's already in the dashboard, great, we can pull from that resource. There are many other resources out there. So maybe we could have um, a discussion at some point that's really focused on answering Nari, Nari's question, but it's time to, to start brainstorming on that, that outcomes thinking. If everybody good with that. Isabella. Um, I mean, I, I think it absolutely should be crowdsourced, but I think, you know, even on this call, there are probably people who have aims or code at the ready. Um, if there, I, and forgive me if this was sent out and I didn't see it, but if there is a data uh, dictionary or a data map that we could look at, and it, I think it will really help us to think about what's possible. I can certainly look at the dashboard and kind of see what's there, but I think without knowing the level of granularity or the sort of back end of it, it's hard to, to know what's possible. I'm thinking maybe, Terry, when you have the fault, when we have that meeting that focuses on the um, kind of the social determinants of health data that aligns with work Isabel is doing, you can walk through part of that. Does that work, Terry? I don't see where I lost Terry. I on think screen. her connection went out. Okay. So yes, I think that's a great idea. And I think that um, Terry is, thank goodness for Terry. She has all of that knowledge. And I know that others on this line too, like Zia and Catherine too, have been involved in, and um, Amanda has been involved as well. So that's a great, um, a great suggestion. Okay. So I'm mindful of time. Amanda, do you want to take it over to public comment? Yes, let's go ahead and open the lines up for public comment. Um, if attendees are on the webinar, you can go ahead and raise your hand. Um, if you're just on the phone, you can press star nine and we'll call on you. And there's always the opportunity to send us your questions or comments at engage at aging.ca.gov. I have lost the participant list. Here we go. Seeing no public comments. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well, again, if anyone feels like um, sending us any uh, insights or ideas or questions, that email address is there for you. Um, and we'll post all these materials online for you to review or share later within about five business days. We'll we'll talk summary, next steps. Um, hand it over to Sarah. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. And um, well, this has just been phenomenal. I can't thank you enough for being here, for participating, for actively participating and thinking about how we can move forward effectively. And we will be in touch about um, these kind of two buckets of work on the community-based qualitative research, uh, qualitative research with, from the person's perspective, as well as the social determinants of health data. Um, and then also thinking about this other question about what are the key outcomes to focus on for the first um, outcomes report that we will be releasing within a year. Um, and that might be an agenda item, I think, at our next meeting. And I've also flagged, as I said, for the agenda discussion um, on the LTSS data dashboard and the HCBS gap analysis. Um, and uh, Oh, I see uh, Oliver has joined Amanda um, for the meeting as well. He's Oliver the cat. Um, and I think that that gets, um, that's, that's, that's everything in terms of next steps. We have our next meeting date for July 15th and then October 20th. One thing we didn't talk about, Susan, do you want to talk briefly about our, the exciting capital engagement, capital conference slash, you know, whatever we want to call it so that we can just uh, let everybody know about that. Absolutely. Um, so as part of your, you are now one of seven Master Plan for Aging Stakeholder Committees. So your advisory groups, you're in great company. And um, we are um, foundation partners, several of two of which are on this call um, and others are sponsoring and convening um, something that 
um, this will be one of the last times we, we, we refer to it as um, the White House Conference on Aging, but it kind of has um, grown out of that concept of the White House Conference on Aging, but we want one of our own for the state of California. And we are looking forward to holding that in Sacramento on September 20th. And this will be a large scale convening of all of the stakeholder groups. So all of you are invited, you'll have a role to play. Um, your meeting will be held. Um, you'll, you'll have opportunity to have a meeting there. And we're, we're gonna do it sort of convention style where these seven or eight stakeholder groups will have a platform that they develop. And we'll start talking to you about that at your July meeting about how you can feed into this conference. And all of those inputs, formal and informal, will shape our next two years of Master Plan for Aging initiatives. So it's also an opportunity. Um, most of this work has been done virtually. So many of the stakeholders that have been working arm in arm um, for years have never met. So we hope that this can all happen in person. And we also hope we can include, we will invite the governor, we'll invite our cabinet secretaries over health and human services, housing, labor, natural resources, because as you know, the master plan is much broader than health and human services. So it's a real chance to interact, engage and um, dialogue and, and to set, um, you know, we wanna hold on to that strong public and stakeholder input that formed the master plan. And now that we're updating it, we don't wanna lose, um, we don't wanna lose that critical piece. So this is, this is where it will happen and you'll all be included. Yes, great. Glad I see Jasmine's uh, has marked her the calendar, so that's great. Um, and Susan, if you don't have anything else, I guess is there any other final questions? Or we close it out from here? Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone. We so look forward to our next convening, and we will be in touch, of course, for to get some good work done in the meantime. So thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Great. Thank, thank you, Sarah. You. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Be well. Bye.